now. Okay. So back to what I was saying. You do have a bunch of blind pouches at the end of your airway. And these are the places where gas exchange takes place. So they're very, very, very thin walled. They're squamous epithelium. And that keeps the diffusion distance very small, which allows diffusion to be fast. And if you take a moment to think about just your experience of being a human who breathes, right? You know that even when you're very relaxed, your breath rate is still pretty fast. So air doesn't spend that much time in your lungs before you excrete it again. Um, so you want the diffusion distance to be very small so that you can basically collect as much oxygen as possible from the environment and dump as much CO2 as possible into the environment. So another way to think about what your lungs do is basically they exist to help you harvest useful molecules from the environment and help you give away molecules that are not useful to you to the environment. So again, due to our anatomy, it seems very much like our lungs are our insides, but in a very real sense, the inside of our lungs is actually in direct contact with the outside world because we're taking the outside world into our chest every time we inhale. So interesting to think about. Okay, so now we're sort of going back up the airway and we are now back in like trachea bronchus territory. So this is a little bit confusing. I just characterize the alveoli, which are very thin walled and good for gas exchange as the sort of respiratory division of the respiratory system. But respiratory epithelium is part of the conducting division. I know it's confusing. I'm sorry, I don't make these rules. Um, so if I were to name it, I'd call it something along the lines of mucociliary epithelium. But again, I, I didn't make this up, so it is what it is. So respiratory epithelium. Uh, it's a type of mucous membrane that is specialized to trap particulate matter that you might breathe in imprison whatever microbes might be in there in mucus and then spit it out or swallow it. So here's how this gets done. And these are some nice trichrome stain alongside of some SEM. So it's, uh, you get the whole picture. So as you can see, ciliated cells, very abundant, very obvious. Goblet cells intermixed, right? So you can see little bundles, inclusions of mucus here. And that's what they look like from the surface. And then, so here we have more goblet cells. Um, we also have granule cells, which are little endocrine cells. So these are diffuse, small granular cells. And then basal cells, which are stem cells. Um, so you, let's see. Can we see any of them? No, we cannot. Um, there's no visible Kolchitsky cells here, um, but you can see all the other kinds. So I'm just telling you what's, what's there basically. And then basal cells are just like in any other epithelium. These are stem cells that give rise to the other cell types in the epithelium. Um, and that's important of course, because like all epithelia, this one is regenerative. So if you lose some, um, don't worry, you'll get it back. Okay, let's talk about olfaction. So respiratory epithelium is a sort of short but cellularly diverse pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Um, olfactory epithelium is that and then some. So as you can see, the pseudostratifiedness of it is enhanced in appearance compared to what I showed you previously. And that's because in addition to support cells, there's also olfactory neurons. So olfactory neurons are bipolar cells. Um, if we 
if this will let me zoom in and I would like to zoom in. Aha, there we go. So bipolar neurons are relatively uncommon in the body, um, but they do exist. And this is one of the places where they do. They're most often found in sensory organs. So bipolar neurons are short neurons where the neurosoma is in the middle. And then there's one dendrite and one axon. So that's what you're seeing here. The dendrite in this case, instead of uh, receiving input from another cell, has olfactory hairs hanging off of it, which are gonna have various um, receptors on them, which detect various odorants. And there's a lot of diversity in the receptor types of the olfactory hairs. And that is why our olfactory experience is so rich and nuanced. So these had a small distance up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Um, so if you're going to take a &P or you've taken it before, the ethmoid bone is a confusing looking bone in the center of your face, right in front of your sphenoid bone, but it has a bunch of little holes in it. And the reason those holes are there is so that you can smell. So once an odorant binds, we get a receptor potential in the bipolar cell that turns into an action potential in the axon, and that sends information up to the olfactory glomerulus, which is uh, the lowest level of scent processing. So if you think about smelling, we just kind of take it for granted, right? Walking around, smell and smell. Some of them are great. Some of them are farts. Um, but it's processed beginning at the olfactory bulb and continuing in the olfactory cortex, both in the primary olfactory area and the accessory one. This sense also intermingles with our sense of taste and our vomeral nasal sense. And it's a very, very old, ancient system. Um, your olfactory nerves have direct projections to your limbic system, which includes uh, smells eliciting powerful emotions, which you guys may have experienced, I know I have, and also um, smells eliciting memory, et cetera. So for example, for me, there's a particular kitchen burnt toast smell that instantly reminds me of my grandmother. And if I, it doesn't matter where I am it, when I smell it, if I smell it, I am transported back to my grandma's kitchen in my grandma's old house. Um, and this is also how we like know what our partners smell like if you're a partnered person. So there's a lot in there. Um, and that's why the olfactory apparatus here is so complicated. It's had a lot of time to evolve. Olfactory systems in vertebrates are fascinating and we are vertebrates. So let's see if we can back out of that. Okay, so speaking of taking smell for granted, you shouldn't. Anosmia is the absence of the sense of smell. Hyposmia, which is just lower than average smell sense, can be caused by damage to the olfactory epithelium or nerve. Um, this can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes it's a surgical accident. So if they're operating on a part of your brain that's near this stuff and it gets a little bit nudged, it can cause hyposmia. Um, the most common cause of anosmia or hyposmia is intranasal drug use. So people snort things like cocaine that contains corrosive alkaloids as well as whatever was mixed with the drug of abuse to sell it with. And those things are all very damaging to living and active cells as you might imagine. Unfortunately for us, if you damage your olfactory epithelium a little bit, um, these are actually pretty regenerative because they have stem cells, but you have to, so you have to really, really mess up your olfactory epithelium um, to permanently remove your sense of smell, but it is possible. But we also lose it gradually over time due to senescence. So um, this does explain a little bit the eating behavior of the very old. Imagine you are very old and you're, you know, trying to eat, but you can't really smell or taste anything. You probably wouldn't be super motivated to eat, would you? Because most of us, let's be honest, eat things because they taste good. 
Um, I'm not going to show them to you now, but speaking of uh, this problem in drugs of abuse, I mentioned corrosive alkaloids and other things. It is possible to basically do that so much that you strip this down to the bone and develop a hole between your oral cavity and your nasal cavity because all that stuff settles down onto the floor of your nasal cavity. So that's a pretty common pathological finding um, in people that are chronic cocaine users, for example, is they have a thin spot or a hole between their oral cavity and their nasal cavity, which is crazy to look at. So you can Google it. Um, there's lots of pictures on the internet of it, but yeah, so don't do drugs. Okay, so here we have a rare cadaver image. So this is a sagittal section of a cadaver head. If you're wondering how you get such an image, I'll tell you, because I've done this, uh, you might be imagining like a fancy bone saw or something. Nope, you just use a hacksaw. Helps if they're cold. And then you wash away all the saw dust and this is what you get. So um, norm normal tools are used for this procedure, but it gives you a really cool view of the oral cavity, the pharynx, this little thing is the opening to the eustachian tube. And then we have the larynx, which is right here. So food is supposed to go this way because this is the esophagus here. And this purple area is the larynx. So you can see the epiglottis here, which is meant to prevent food from going in your breathing hole. That's not ideal. Um, and then you have a stiff cartilaginous sort of box, which allows you to produce sounds. So that's our voice box. So as a cartilaginous chamber, one of its functions is to keep food and drink out of the airway. The other function um, here we have the vocal fold uh, is to, of course, produce noises. So at rest, the epiglottis stands up almost vertically. So this is, of course, a cadaver. Their tissues are a little bit more malleable. So when, when you and me are not actively swallowing, our epiglottis is basically sitting here, uh, butting up against the root of our tongue. So this one is a little bit down. When you swallow, what you do is you move the bolus of food into this pocket you move your tongue back to the back of your oropharynx and that pushes the bolus against the epiglottis, shutting it, and then the food slides past the epiglottis into the esophagus. So there's a brief tutorial on swallowing for you guys. It's more complicated than you might think. And if you try to, oh, for example, talk while doing that, you stand an increased risk of timing things poorly and then getting food in your airway which is not good at all. So inflammation of the larynx or laryngitis changes the shape of the vocal cords and that's what produces the loss of voice. So if you're ever wondering like, why, why do I lose my voice? What does that look like? It means that your vocal cords, instead of being thin and white are thick and red and angry and probably producing a transudate of extracellular fluid um, and that's why your throat hurts and why you can't talk. So I actually got laryngitis last spring at the beginning of COVID when we switched over to online teaching because due to the need to record all the videos that are now on my YouTube channel, and if you look, there's lots, I was recording and also lecturing. So basically I was getting up in the morning and talking all day until I went to bed, no breaks. And my larynx was like, hey, yeah, nope. And I lost my voice for about a week. So that's not gonna happen again, but um, literally talking too much can do that. You also can get polyps, which are called singer's nodules. Um, famously, Meatloaf, the singer, lost his voice for a while due to vocal nodules. I'm seeing a comment in the chat. Oh my God, a year. Uh, somebody's parent completely lost their voice for a year after singing a high note. Yeah, I can imagine. That's intense. But yeah, so it's possible to damage your larynx by overdoing it uh, as evidenced by me, my student's mom, thank you for sharing. And of course, notably, meatloaf. 
he's the guy that's saying i'll do anything for love but i won't do that remember him um so yeah reactive polyps sometimes require surgery um and after that your uh an ear nose and throat doctor does that for you and after that they tell you to be on complete vocal rest which means you're not allowed to talk you're not allowed to cough um you have to leave your larynx alone for sometimes quite a long time so it's a serious surgery Yes, I would recommend looking up Meatloaf. He's a, an interesting musical artist. Okay, so this is a coronal section of the larynx, which allows you to see the vocal cords in the place where they meet. And as you can see, there's a little epithelium covering them underneath is connective tissue. So it's possible to make this angry, right? So we have the laryngeal vestibule, and then you can see glands up here. They are seromucous glands, which means they have mixed acini, where in an acinus there are some serous cells and some mucous cells. They look a lot like the, gland, the seromucous glands of the esophagus, but they're in the larynx. There's the vestibular folds above the ventricle and then below that are the vocal cords. So the vestibular folds are sometimes called false vocal cords. These are the true vocal cords. Um, and then you have the vocalis muscle, which basically is gonna help to move these two cords further towards or away from each other. Um, and that allows you to modulate your vocal pitch. So if I wanna talk in a weird high voice, I'm gonna stretch my vocal cords out and move them close together. And then if I wanna do a weird low voice, I'm going to make my vocal cords shorter and thicker, um, which means they're going to vibrate more slowly. So it works on the same principle as a guitar string, right? So the taut skinny ones produce a high sound and the thick, looser ones produce a lower sound. And yes, it does look like both the big, huge statue of Jesus Christ in Rio de Janeiro and the wild and wacky inflatable tube man that we know and love from used car lots. Also, behold, here's some lymphatic tissue and here's some more over here. So again, this is a place where you're passing air, which comes from the outside, into you. And so from a defense standpoint, it makes a lot of sense to put a little immuno immunological police box there, right? So one of your tasks as histologists is to learn to recognize all the tissue type components of a picture and then what configuration they're in in order to figure out what it is you're looking at. So, you know, this is skeletal muscle. This is lymphatic tissue. This is glandular epithelium. Um, and it's configured in this very unique shape. So those things together check all the boxes for larynx. Okay, trachea. First thing to know about the trachea, it's shorter than you think. It's only between four and six centimeters long in most people. So we think of it as being very, very long because we can sense things in our airway all the way down to our bronchi, but it's not long at all. So there's C-shaped rings of hyaline cartilage. Remember hyaline cartilage? It's got a glassy, beautiful matrix and then little isogenous clusters of chondrocytes in their lacunae. So these little C-shapes are not complete rings. So they're ring in name only. And that's because the tip is connected by a piece of smooth muscle called the tracheolus muscle. The reason for that is your esophagus is glued to the back of your trachea. And when you swallow, you need for this tracheolus muscle to be able to relax and allow the passage of a food bolus. If you did not have the tracheolus and you just had a solid ring, swallowing would be painful for you. So uh, ring really means horseshoe shape with a tip to tip connection by smooth muscle. So the lumen of the trachea is a fairly classical mucous membrane. So we've got respiratory epithelium lining the lumen and then a lamina propria of loose connective tissue um, 
leading to a submucosa of dense irregular connective tissue featuring lots and lots of serum mucus glands. So this is one of my favorite terms in anatomy. I love saying it. So I'm gonna just let you know that I'm biased here. Mucociliary escalator basically means snot elevator. So this is important. Consider what's in the environment. And earlier I was talking about allergies. So it seems like an appropriate time to use that as an example. So let me tell you a story. In our area, during the springtime, plants try to have sex. Plants don't have sex like we have sex. There's no intromission. Instead, like many organisms, plants have sex by dumping their gametes into the air and hoping that their gametes collide. So for you and I, what that would look like is just taking our sperm and eggs and hurling them into the atmosphere and then being like, golly, I hope two of those meet and produce an offspring. That's the plant respiratory strategy. So plant gametes, uh, pollen particles, have lots of adaptations to stay airborne. So they're light, they have little air cells, they're pretty good at floating in the air. Um, and they're also carried around by our pollinator friends. So birds, bees, etc. cetera. Um, so the take home message there is that there's plant sex molecules in the air at this time of year. I'm breathing them in right now, which is why I feel kind of icky. Some of you are probably feeling the same way. The majority of those get trapped in the mucus lining our airway. That's good because mucus is a gel, which is interlocking proteins with water suspended between. Those are really difficult for microbes to swim in and they're good at trapping and immobilizing particles. And then the cilia take the pollen and bacteria and other stuff that we've breathed in and they beat that mucus up towards the pharynx where you either swallow it and then whatever you inhaled dies in your stomach acid, or you make a gross sound and hawk it up, depending. So this is a critical component of airway health. Um, so a couple of things here, it's always good to do sort of uh, application questions. Think back to when we were talking about cell organelles and we talked about mutations in ones that would cause infertility. What infertility cause would also affect the mucociliary escalator? What, what cell organelle would be affected if that was the case? It's okay if you don't immediately know, I'll give you the answer in a moment. Yes, cilia, absolutely. So cilia, as we described previously, are internally complex. They have this very cool arrangement of a rotor shaft and socket made out of microtubules. And then there's myosin and actin, which cause them to rotate relative to each other and that whips the cilia around. So that uh, causes um, infertility in people who produce sperm because their sperm can't swim. And it causes really bad respiratory problems as well because their mucociliary escalator does not work. So these people have mucus that traps particulate, but the mucus falls down where it's not supposed to and drastically and deeply impairs respiration. So that's no bueno. Um, there's another example that I have. It's just going to take me one second. Yeah, here we go. So uh, I watched, a, I think it was a 2020, a little bit ago about this guy. Um, I recommend either reading about this or watching the documentary. So this man is a surgeon. So he's not posing as a doctor. But basically he claimed to invent this powerful artificial trachea surgery. 
um, where basically they took the same plastic that water bottles are made of and installed them in place of the trachea. And nearly all of his patients died. If we go back to the PowerPoint, so here's him proudly holding up his uh, BS tracheal replacements. Um, he also defrauded this nice lady and she talks about it a lot on the uh, television show. So again, definitely recommend it. It's fascinating medically and it's also fascinating psychologically, but remember this face, not an honest dude. Um, yeah, this person died. So it's not good enough just to have a tube here. You have to have an active ciliary and mucous epithelium in order to move things out of your lung. So you can't just install a plastic bottle tube here. That will kill people. Um, yeah, I agree. It does sound like a terrible idea. When I was watching it with my fiance, I was like screaming at the television. He was looking at me like I was a crazy person. Um, because even somebody with relatively sort of a, a lay person's understanding of how this works can see that's terrible. Um, no, he's not in jail. He escaped to Spain where he has an entire family and career independent of any of this. And he is not going to be extradited. So he's just living his best life on the coast of Spain. Uh, he's a really good, so someone is asking about how it got FDA approved. He's a really good con man. And not everybody in the FDA has a deep histological understanding of how the airway works. So I guess it's an important lesson. And the lesson is if somebody, including me, is presenting mastery to you, make sure that it's in the right context where they don't have anything to gain significantly and always be, always be a skeptic. Um, Americans tend to intrinsically trust doctors because we're like, well, they went to a lot of school and they're smart. So they probably are telling the truth, but no, you can be a BS artist and an idiot and still be a doctor. It's totally possible to be both. So <laughs> just be careful. Don't trust Italian guys who tell you that you can make a trachea out of a plastic bottle. I'm interested to see what kind of YouTube comments I get about that. <laughs> I guess we'll see. All right, so let's talk about coughing. If you could peer inside of this little, well, I'm not going to mince words, underwear shaped piece of cartilage, you would see a little fin in the middle of it. This fin has irritant receptors on it, as well as a covering. Hold on, I'm going to sneeze. All right, sneeze has passed. Anyway, the carina has an irritant receptor on it. And so basically if anything falls down and hits the carina or irritates it, you're in a cough. Or if it's just persistently irritated because the mucosa is in, um, that is gonna cause you to cough as well. So cough suppressants actually act on the brain stem in the vagus nerve, which is the parasympathetic innervation of all of this that coordinates your coughing reflex. Um, so if you have a dry cough, which is just going to hurt you over time, you want to take a cough suppressant so you don't damage your tissue any further. Um, productive coughs are treated with expectorants like mucinex, which basically help get the mucus loose so you're able to expel it. So um, this is good medical advice for just home purposes. So if you have a dry cough, don't take mucinex. You're not going to help yourself. Take a cough suppressant. If you have a wet cough, get the mucus out first before you do the cough suppressant. Um, that can really help you take the guesswork out of how to feel better fast if you feel crappy and you have a lower respiratory tract infection. Uh, there's a question in the chat. What, what happened to the guy that claimed he could do a head transplant? I don't remember. I remember regarding that headline with deep suspicion and then I just kind of looked past it. So I'll, if you wanna look it up while I'm talking, be my guest, um, but I, I'm gonna look it up later too. Okay, so here's another nice picture of the relationship between the trachea and the esophagus. 
And so we've got cartilage, but if you look, there's, oh, look, there's ossification happening. This happens with age. So you get what is non-medically termed a crunchy trachea as you get older. Um, essentially what happens is the stem cells in the perichondrium get a mistaken memo that some of them are supposed to differentiate into osteocytes and not chondrocytes. So cell, cell, cell signaling gets a little bit wonky as we age. Um, and this is representative of that. So we've got trachea, we've got a fibroelastic membrane. See these streaks? These streaks are streaks of smooth muscle of the trachealis. Um, and then we've got the esophagus here. So as you can see, if you take a big bite of a burrito, it's going to stretch this. And we have this nice elastic membrane to allow it to pass with no pain. So this is just zoomed in. We've got, sub, we've got the mucosa. Here's a thin muscularis mucosa. We've got a submucosa full of blood vessels and glands. And then we have cartilage. And in the case of an aging trachea, bone tissue as well. Someone in the chat is referencing day quilts. We were talking about uh, cough suppressants. Ah, it was on a corpse. Okay. Um, yeah, there's last time I went to a A&P conference many moons ago before COVID, um, there was a guy who was talking about experimental procedures being done on cadavers and how that's a really powerful technique, but I, I would be dubious about it uh, <laughs> here. And then with regard to the day quilt, yeah, so be careful. Uh, dextromethorphan is a powerful uh, consciousness altering <laughs> agent and it's in Dayquil and it can make you do and say things you don't recall. So as with all medications, go with caution. But also Dayquil has really saved my butt when I have been really, really sick, but had to lecture anyway. So, you know, just be careful. 